Now we're going to turn to another set of questions and, and points around assisted reproductive technologies. This is a broad class of, of re reproductive technologies, includes in vitro fertilization, that is fertilization of egg and sperm outside of uh, the uterus, includes ovarian induction, artificial insemination, and a number of other uh, techniques whose broadly speaking uh, purpose is to help improve um, uh, reproductive outcomes, uh, to improve the chances of getting pregnant, uh, and, uh, and, and, and ensure a healthy pregnancy during that. Now, assisted reproductive technologies, of course, are meant to help realize the re reproductive goals of parents. We'll return to exactly how those re reproductive goals should be understood in a minute. There's been some interesting legal developments um, a few years ago in Singapore in that regard. Now, this uh, is maybe not quite as fraught or as um, a polarizing issue as abortion, but there are still some that oppose assisted, some forms of assisted reproductive technologies. Uh, on various grounds, including the idea that this is unnatural. Uh, indeed, it's hard to deny this is incredibly unnatural. It is very unnatural for a fetus, uh, sorry, sort of an embryo to be uh, generated outside of a womb, for example. Um, there's also concerns uh, about exploitation, that um, some uh, assisted reproductive technologies, particularly those offered by private sector firms, might be exploiting the desire for, uh, for a child for economic gain. Um, those debates are, are ongoing, uh, though uh, generally speaking, assisted reproductive technologies are available uh, in Singapore under careful regulation to protect the interests of intended parents. So I want to look, though, at one particular case that will highlight this idea of the interests that the parents have in assisted reproductive technologies. And this is the case of ACB versus Thompson Medical. Uh, a Singaporean case that, um, that occurred um, some time ago, actually occurred in 2010, and uh, the court case was adjudicated in 2017. There's a couple, uh, one uh, German, one, uh, one of Chinese uh, origins, uh, undergoing in vitro fertilization. This was their second child. Uh, there was a successful birth, healthy birth, um, but they noted the baby's, baby's physical features seemed different from their parents, particularly uh, skin tone and uh, hair texture. And genetic testing confirmed the baby was related to the mother, but not the husband. A further investigation revealed uh, that there was an anonymous sperm donor that, for, uh, due to some uh, missteps on the part of Thompson Medical, accidentally were used to inseminate the mother's eggs and was used for fertilization. So the embryo was indeed the, uh, genetically related to the uh, intended mother, but not the intended father. So, uh, as one might expect, the couple sued uh, a, a filed lawsuit against uh, Thompson Medical for negligence. Uh, and they, they claim um, what they were trying, the money they were trying to get out, they claimed, well, they would like compensation in the form of upkeep of the child, um, which is uh, the result of raising a child with essentially unwanted genes. And they put in that the pro cost of, for example, private schooling in Beijing, where the child was going to go to school, apparently. Uh, but the Court of Appeal didn't want to just grant this relief um, without careful consideration. Because if you just say, all right, we're going to give you compensation in the form of the cost of the upkeep of the child, this might send the wrong message. It might send the message that the child is unwanted, or a sense that actually the child is a harm. The child is what's called a tort. Uh, and that's actually a, a very pernicious thing to say, to say that this child is by merely existing, causing harm to the parents. And a court judgment that could validate that, that very pernicious signal. And the court doesn't want to send that signal as a matter of public policy and as a, as a matter of decency. So um, the court had to look through a series of a, a very long judgment to consider different options here. So it couldn't appeal to this wrongful birth, this idea that it is wrong to bring somebody into existence because that might deny the dignity of that individual who was born. Um, and, but they still didn't want to say, okay, they didn't want to say, cannot just uh, go home and, and, and say sorry, because, well, very clearly Thompson Medical had done something very harmful. It was intuitive that something very badly wrong had occurred. It's something, something that does merit compensation. So they don't want to say that, oh, just toss the lawsuit entirely. So what did the court do? It created a novel category, uh, novel in Singapore and actually novel in, in, in many jurisdictions internationally, of a loss, that is, a loss that can be compensated in court. And that's a loss of genetic affinity, okay? a loss of being genetically related in a certain way to one's child. Uh, and the claim was essentially the couples have this interest in being genetically related to the child that is born, and that interest was subverted by the wrong sperm being used uh, in this case. So now what is this genetic affinity? Uh, it's complex. It seems to have a biological basis through a genetic test that can be occurred, but it also has social implications. Indeed, the reasons people seem to care about this genetic relation is partly determined and affected by the social environment that they're, uh, they're raised in, they, they, they exist in. So it's a biological um, uh, fact, whether or not someone is genetically related to a child, 
but it has socially inscribed value. And the way the core characterized this was interesting. They said the desire for genetic affinity is complex and multifaceted, right? Not easily characterized. It is at its core a desire for identity, identity bounded in consanguinity and in, in bounded in genetic relation. And the court viewed that this value is significant. And it picked a number. It said that, okay, maybe not 100% of upkeep. It ended up picking a number, which might be, might be disputed, but this is what the court thought. That the value of this genetic affinity that was lost was about 30%. You know, a little less than a third of the cost of upkeep of the child. Um, and that, that, that number is, was used as the basis for the award that was given uh, in this case. Um, now, you might still ask, okay, that's kind of what uh, social uh, genetic affinity is, but what's the basis of this value? Why should we accept that genetic affinity has any value? Well, is it because we have these evolutionary impulses? Um, you know, it's evolutionary fit for us to prefer a genetically related offspring because this way our own genes will be promulgated, right? Good, very clear evolutionary biological story can be given for why human beings really want to ensure uh, genetic relation of their children, to ensure propagation of their genetic material. Um, that's an evolutionary biological, sto biological story, but what does that have to do with what matters? Why does it really matter what evolutionary uh, pressures would have put in? Why is that of ethical relevance? We could turn to the social aspect, say, well, society or people in society seem to value this. Again, there's social expectations surrounding, uh, surrounding genetic relation that might ground this. But again, is that really going to be a firm basis for, um, for, for an ethical value? My own view, I think, you know, not necessarily the one universally accepted in the literature, but I think, I think my, uh, a view that is worth considering is that some values are just basic. Some values are not dependent on other further facts. Some values are just primary, and uh, even if there's some causal factors that led to their existence, the mere, they're, 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 they're valuable in and of themselves. And that's because uh, they are fundamental to many people's life projects. And I would suggest uh, ethics has to bottom out somewhere, and this is a fair place for it to bottom out. And indeed, it is demonstrable that for many folks, uh, genetic affinity does have this sort of basic core, uh, core value, a value not derived from other things that, that, um, uh, that it can achieve. And indeed, I think this drive for IVF, the desire to undertake substantial costs, substantial physical burden, substantial health risks through IVF and other assisted reproductive technologies, does reflect this valuation of genetic affinity. And indeed, the social support that is put forward recognizes the value um, in, uh, in that. Uh, uh, because if we didn't think genetic affinity was of any value, then indeed there might be not much reason to promote IVF because, well, there's always alternatives like adoption for example, that would not you know, um, uh, result in genetic affinity, but would result in being able to raise a child. Uh, but many folks are not satisfied or would prefer to have uh, a genetically related child. And so understanding the value of genetic affinity can help explain and ground why so much is invested in uh, IVF and ART. And going forward, why continued public money might be justifiable to spend in this area. Uh, and that might ground what, what is called positive, the positive right or positive duties we have to promote reproductive autonomy. Um, to provide material support to enable couples uh, to, to reproduce if uh, natural means are out of their uh, abilities. Okay, another uh, important and expanding aspect of IVF that attracts a number of, of debates and uh, disagreements is pre-implantation genetic testing. So with IVF, um, oftentimes uh, one would generate more embryos than are absolutely necessary. We want to maximize the chance of a vial pregnancy. And so you'll generate as many embryos as might be feasible, perhaps, uh, in order to ensure um, that as many will be vi vi you'll find at least one viable embryo, or maybe multiple vi viable embryos, if multiple embryos will be implanted. Uh, now, if, uh, but there will be a certain maximum number of embryos that could be implanted, and you might have more viable embryos than could be reasonably implanted. In that case, one must choose between viable embryos. And what's the basis for this choice? Well, one possibility is to do some genetic testing on those embryos, look at the genetic profile, and use genetic analysis as the basis for deciding between different viable embryos in terms of implantation. Now, this has been defended. This practice has been defended uh, by those that want to promote the welfare of the future child. The idea is, well, maybe certain genetic variants would be uh, correlated with better outcomes in terms of health and well-being. And we have general obligations as parents to promote the well-being of our children in the future. And so we should avail, avail ourselves, when possible, of this genetic testing during embryo selection. Uh, and it might also respect reproductive autonomy. You know, think about the freedom to choose when and how to have children. Maybe that includes the how includes the sort of information we take into account when deciding which of these embryos to bring into existence. And indeed, choosing between embryos is choosing essentially what child will result from IVF. 
It also might argue, be argued from a social point of view. Uh, genetic uh, pre-implantation genetic testing and choosing embryos on this basis could reduce social disease burden, a public disease burden, and possibly have good social effects in that regard. But there are a number of concerns uh, from various quarters over pre-implantation uh, genetic testing. I think the biggest uh, articulation of this is the idea of eugenics, the specter of eugenics. And eugenics is an old movement um, where it was previously done coercively, but even in the modern sense where informed consent is obtained, there's a concern that there's a drive to improve the genetic stock in society that is pernicious in certain ways. One way is that it might be seen to promote discriminatory uh, uh, attitudes or behaviors towards those with undesirable uh, traits, those with traits that might be seen as less fit genetically or, or, or less appealing. That reinforce uh, stigma, for example, in those groups and, and, and make them seem are perceived as um, not as worthwhile, not as uh, choice-worthy at the point of, of selection. It might also open the door to non-medical trait selection. You know, this idea of human enhancement through looking at maybe intelligence, height, mood, or other, other phenotypes that don't relate to healthy outcomes. That might be opened up as a possibility once we start conducting pre implantation genetic testing. And this, in turn, leads to concerns about genetic inequality. You know, is, is, is financial inequality going to realize itself in our very biology? Much science fiction is concerned with this idea of genetic inequality. For example, the science fiction film Gattaca um, is a dystopian um, uh, example of this. But short of dystopian uh, uh, visions, there's questions of even soft social pressure. Could one, could kind of the consent or the, uh, the consensual nature of genetic testing be undermined if there creates social expectation to, to make use of testing? It might also, again, get back to one of the concerns about Naturalness with IVF, it might again relate to concerns about the na uh, removing the naturalness of our traits and suddenly we become products uh, rather than people and the dehumanization uh, of people is a concern of uh, uh, if we go uh, too far down uh, genetic testing and implementation in embryonic selection. So in Singapore, uh, it takes a somewhat balanced approach. PGT uh, 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 during IVF is permitted, but only for a prescribed set of conditions and chromosomal abnormalities. Um, one could go beyond this list, but only with special M MOH permission. Generally speaking, um, this list, it's, uh, it's got uh, several dozen entries into it, uh, includes several debilitating genetic conditions, uh, things like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Interestingly, it also includes certain uh, genetic uh, traits that are uh, risk factors for diseases later on, something like BRCA1 or 2 variants, which are not determinative um, of getting breast or ovarian cancer later in life, but substantially increase the risk of that happening. Um, and and it, it, um, uh, it might only occur uh, many decades later. Uh, that was considered significant enough to include on that, on that, on that list. So yeah, so both includes genetic disorders, but also um, risk, uh, genetic risk, uh, substantial genetic risk um, of getting certain diseases later in life. Okay, let's also look at the issue of surrogacy. Uh, so some women uh, may face difficulty carrying um, a fetus to term. So even if you undertake IVF, um, uh, some women might have, have difficulty after implantation uh, of bearing that child. Surrogacy is one potential remedy, the idea being that an embryo generated from an intended mother or father's gametes through IVF is then implanted in a third party, a different woman's womb, and then after birth, that woman who gestated the, uh, the child uh, returns the, uh, the child uh, to the intended mother and father who basically adopt the child as their own, um, although they already are uh, uh, genetically related to the child. Now, surrogacy could be altruistic or, or unpaid, or it could be with compensation uh, for, the, um, uh, for the burdens and the costs involved. Now, defenders of surrogacy say that, look, this enables uh, women with difficulty to bear children to maintain that genetic affinity, right? That, that, that affinity, which uh, we said earlier, seems to have value in many societies, including in Singapore. It, again, might be seen as a form of reproductive autonomy, both for the intended parents to, uh, to be able to avail themselves of reproductive services as they see fit, but also arguably for the surrogate. You might say, well, look, it should be seen as one's autonomy to uh, gestate on others' behalf, especially maybe in the case of altruistic uh, surrogacy to enable an individual who wants to empower maybe a, a friend or a relative to have a child. Um, this might be seen as respecting their right to, uh, to, to, to assist them in that way. Uh, in addition, just on the question of payment, which is a particularly fraught uh, area in surrogacy, that could be argued to be acceptable in recognition of um, bearing a child, carrying a child to term is very burdensome, is very risky, and it's maybe it's fair enough that there be compensation uh, for that in terms of maybe monetary compensation or other, other benefits that could be provided. But there are many, many critics, especially in the case of paid surrogacy, but, but it goes beyond that. Uh, there's concerns that it commodifies childbearing and the human body 
that leads to potential exploitation of taking advantage of desperation, um, of, of inducing people to make use of their bodies for financial gain, which might be, uh, be seen as, as objectionable. And indeed, there might be uh, many long-term physical and psychological consequences for surrogates. Uh, and further, there might be disputes. Um, some surrogates, especially if the surrogacy happens abroad and there's, no, there's only weak legal protections, some surrogates might change their mind and want to retain custody after birth. And, and there will be uh, substantial challenges, uh, both in terms of the legal dispute, but also the potential trauma of a child having to go through such a, such a custody dispute uh, if the surrogacy arrangement is not honored. So Singapore takes, uh, unlike maybe in the PGT case, in this case takes a fairly strict uh, prohibitor uh, prohibitory line uh, so surrogacy, whether altruistic or commercial, is currently prohibited in Singapore. Uh, and this policy is, is uh, put forward to be justified based on promoting traditional family structures. Now, it is still technically possible to seek a surrogate abroad uh, for a Singaporean couple to uh, seek a surrogate surrogacy services in a different country that does have it legal, although more and more countries are, are uh, criminalizing or, 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 uh, or prohibiting surrogacy. Um, it's still possible to go abroad to other, other, other places. Uh, but this creates its own set of ethical risks and legal risks as well. Issues of medical tourism, of exploitation of foreigners, uh, and again, of, of very uh, tricky legal questions that will come up concerning uh, uh, questions of, of adoption and questions of, of custody disputes if there are any disputes that emerge. Okay, uh, now let's turn to a very recent development in social egg freezing. Singapore and many other places around the world, especially high-income countries, um, there is uh, a trend towards people getting married later and fertility rates uh, falling, right? people having fewer and fewer children. Indeed, these two things are not unrelated. Uh, due to delays in marital age, um, there is um, age-related infertility. Right? So as one gets older, uh, uh, one, it becomes more and more difficult to, ha to, ha to have a successful pregnancy. And so by getting married later, you might um, uh, reduce the chances of uh, ever having or having the children, uh, number of children that one wants. And there's different ways of trying to address this, many different policy avenues to try to address these, uh, this, these challenges. One path, not the only path, but one potential uh, attempt at ameliorating this challenge is social egg freezing uh, or elective egg freezing. In this, context, in this uh, social egg freezing context, women would pay money uh, to extract an oocyte from their bodies when they're young and relatively healthy uh, and when they're maybe potentially single or maybe they're married but they're not ready to have a child. And they're extracting it uh, at that point uh, in order to potentially make use of it later. So the idea as well as age-related fertility um, uh, takes on, maybe they want to have a child at 40, uh, they would make use of that frozen egg instead of um, uh, the eggs they're currently producing to maximize their chances of a successful pregnancy. Now proponents, just as most of these questions, there's, you know, there's kind of uh, positions on both sides. Proponents, proponents say this is again maybe an expression of reproductive autonomy. Again, the freedom to decide what one does with one's reproductive material, including one's, one's oocytes, uh, and the ability to, to freeze them is, is one such action that could be within the scope of, re of reproductive autonomy. Could also be seen as reducing anxiety um, over uh, concerns about biological clock uh, ticking and family and career trade-offs. But of course, there's also the uh, broader social question um, of, well, could this actually make a dent maybe in the fertility crisis that Singapore and many other countries face? Opponents, or maybe those that are more concerned, about this, uh, this practice uh, argue that, well, this might involve selling hope, selling uh, the prospect of something that seems like a really great idea, but actually in reality may not have the benefits that people expect. Uh, so one paper from uh, just a couple years ago um, looked at analysis of, of, of the outcomes of, of egg freezing and found only a small percentage of women who do freeze their eggs actually end up using them. Uh, and indeed, of those who use them, uh, uh, pregnancy rates are, are uh, not so successful. Although some of this literature uh, should be taken carefully because some of this mixes together social egg freezing and egg, egg freezing for uh, clinical indications. Uh, and there might be different success rates in these two groups. But nevertheless, um, there is, uh, in most cases, most cases where egg freezing is undertaken, in most cases that, will, that, that egg will not result in uh, a child being born. And in addition, because of the costs involved and because of these low, relatively low um, uh, use and success rates, it's unlikely to make a big dent in that social fertility rate um, and, and solve, the, solve the fertility crisis. Um, there also might be concerns that social egg freezing creates an incentive to delay marriage and childbearing. Let's say, well, look, maybe you know, that there's some social value to that sort of desperation to get married earlier because if you can kind of freeze your eggs, you, can just, uh, you don't have to be so concerned about getting married sooner. And that could have detrimental effects on marital rates and the uh, drive for uh, improving uh, natural childbearing rates. 
It also might be seen as routinizing IVF because if you're kind of freezing your egg, you can only make use of it later if you're undertaking IVF. Uh, and, it might, uh, and that includes a considerable expense, uh, burden, and physical risk uh, to the intended mother. So in Singapore, uh, there's been a change recently, whereas previously social egg freezing was generally not permitted. Uh, it was basically legalized in 2023. Uh, this was based on advice from the white paper uh, on uh, Singapore women's development. And that document uh, stated very clearly that it recognized this desire to preserve fertility through increasing the chance of conceiving if they marry later. I think that would again reflect this value of genetic affinity we talked about earlier. And they also noted that there was no compelling medical reason to prohibit elective egg freezing as it is medically viable. You know, maybe success rates aren't perfect, but no fertility treatment is. And, and, and there are indeed many cases of successful pregnant, uh, pregnancies uh, uh, born out of frozen eggs. Uh, so this has been uh, put in place for, I guess, uh, by this point, this recording, about a year now. Uh, it includes counseling requirements. Uh, of course, informed consent remains very important uh, and, and ensuring there is realism and we don't oversell the hype uh, of social egg freezing. You know, those sort of statistics we talked about, disclosing those statistics ahead of time is very important. Uh, so a realistic understanding of, of likelihood of, of use and, and uptake uh, is, is, is known at the point of, of, uh, of social egg freezing. Uh, indeed, there's also going to be a general requirement of uh, retaining um, uh, individual consent and also the requirement that um, later on, the, when IVF is undertaken and an egg is retrieved, that the individual be married as required under Singapore law. And also um, under Singapore law, IVF is undertaken with the consent of both the uh, mother and the father uh, in that case. And that would, that, while social egg freezing itself, the egg can be frozen with just the consent of the mother. It can only be retrieved later on uh, with the consent of both the mother and the father. Okay, so those are some current uh, debates and current policy moves in the area of assisted reproduction. And then the last uh, little bit here, I just want to flag some, some emerging topics. These are technologies that are not quite at the realm of human implementation, but they are, they are being used in, in animal models already, and they could be applied to humans in the coming years or decades. And they have substantial Im impacts, potential impacts, on reproduction and indeed human society. And these two developments I'll highlight are in vitro gametogenesis and artificial wombs. So in vitro gametogenesis is the idea of developing egg or sperm uh, from adult cells, maybe skin cells. You could take off a skin cell and uh, create induced pluripotent stem cells that could then be used to generate egg or sperm. So instead of social egg freezing, right, you don't need to freeze the egg at all in the beginning. You can generate the eggs later on um, from adult cells. Uh, and that would again remove the concern about sperm and egg degradation by age. A second development that is maybe independent research track but is related to some potential upheavals to reproductive space is the idea of an artificial womb. And this is the capacity to gestate a fetus outside of a woman's uterus. Many potential health-based applications particularly would be valuable for the treatment of premature infants to uh, increase the likelihood before that you know, 24 week uh, point, to increase the likelihood of survival. Uh, but could be used um, much earlier in another context um, uh, for, again, those that have trouble gestating more generally as a fertility treatment. And these two uh, innovations combined, uh, in theory, could eliminate the problem of age-related infertility. Uh, and that could radically change the nature of childbearing, the nature of parenthood, the age at which parenthood occurs, um, and could also more substantially change the way human reproduction is seen in society. Uh, and these, when, you, when you have these kind of big substantial social changes, you need to be a little bit careful. You need to reflect and, and you know, talk to folks, talk to folks about how they feel about these changes and, and whether or not these would be seen as overly socially disruptive. And what sort of regulations, if any, need to be put in place. Again, what the limits are on reproductive autonomy to undertake these, um, uh, these interventions, whether or not any limits should be put in place. And finally, there, there are some implications potentially for that uh, debate over abortion. I mentioned before, well, that 24-week cutoff oftentimes is justified based on a rough estimate of, of viability. Um, but if we are going to produce artificial wombs and other techniques that would make viability uh, outside of a woman's womb possible at any age, you know, um, those justifications of abortion uh, might, uh, might become under threat and abortion law might need to be revisited, or these justifications of the law might need to be revisited. Okay, so to wrap up what we've talked about today, uh, we've discussed the basic concepts in reproductive ethics, including the idea of patienthood as well as personhood, who is a patient, who is a person. We looked at the idea of reproductive autonomy, which really underpins most debates, I think, in uh, reproductive ethics, uh, and how that relates to, again, decision-making autonomy and who makes decisions in the case of, of, of health care uh, and pregnancy. We looked at some of the contentious debates in this area, particularly around consent, 
uh, and the very heated topic of abortion and showed the different sides of that debate and where the debate stands, as well as the status in Singapore, how it's been resolved, at least for now, in the legal sphere in Singapore. Uh, and finally, we looked at an overview of some of the key points of contention in assisted reproduction, not a full gamut of all the different topics in assisted reproduction. There are many other areas we didn't have time to talk about today, um, but some of, the, some of the key fulcrums of debate uh, and where reproductive rights might conflict with other social values. I hope this debate has been, uh, this discussion has been illuminating uh, and informative concerning core areas of reproductive ethics. Thank you very much.